Hello, this is Thomas with Geon Technologies, and welcome to part two of our Yocto Open Embedded series, where we're going to target an actual piece of hardware, the Avnet MicroZ. If you're following along with your own, you'll need an 8 gigabyte SD card. Last time, we used Google's repo tool to target the default manifest we have posted on GitHub. With it, we downloaded all of the Yocto Open Embedded and Geon meta layers that describe the source code we want to have for our target. We then used the Open Embedded init script and template conf to bootstrap our build environment for MetaRedHawk SDR. This time, we're going to extend that environment to include Xilinx's Meta Xilinx layer. From there, we'll pick a new machine, bit bake again, and deploy to an SD card using our build script. We'll then need to make some minor changes on the first boot before repeating the last session's will it node booter test. First, navigate to the project directory you created last time, the one that contains the build and Pocky folder. Change into the Pocky folder and clone the Krogoth branch of Meta Xilinx from the Xilinx GitHub repository. Head back to the project root, and if you haven't set up your environment this time, do so by using the script as shown, specifying again the locations of the build folder and bitbake. You should now be back in your build directory. If you recall last time, we looked at the BB layers file and talked about how we can insert new layers. Insert a reference to our new Meta Xilinx layer after Meta Yocto. Since this is a board support package layer, it should be really close to the base layers for the sake of other layers inheriting or extending its own recipes. We want Pockies to get picked up first, then extended by Xilinx, which could then be extended by some other layer. Save the changes and return to your build folder. You may also remember from last time that we specified the machine environment variable based off of the name that we found in Pockies MetaConf machine directory. Meta Xilinx is similar in that it specifies several possible targets in the Meta Xilinx Conf machine directory. I have a MicroZ. And the name Xilinx has listed for that target is microz zinc 7 So that is the new machine name for me. Now I need to pause for a second. Xilinx's documentation on how to create a bootable SD card with a non-volatile root file system exists in the README at their root level as well as a different document in their docs directory. The procedures described in those two places are different from one another as of the time of this video. And neither procedure really reflects the reality of this build, namely U-Boot does not get configured with the correct environment variables and is never set up to import variables from a text file like Xilinx suggests. We're going to fix that after the build manually in U-Boot during the first boot up. The more correct way would be to append the various recipes to nudge all the parameters into being correct, but that's a great topic for something to do as an in-class lab, so we're shelving it for now. Back to the build, we're going to use the build script that we adopted from the E310 project, which was made by Philip Ballister of Edis Research. The script handles calling out bitbake, collecting deployment files, and generating a dual partition image that can be copied straight to the SD card. Its assumption, therefore, is that your target's BSP is set up to boot in this way as well. Let's link that script into our build directory now. We specified our new target's name as microzzinc7 for the machine variable. Our script also requires the build image variable to be set, which is just redhawk-base-image, as we used in the previous video. Now we're on the build script. If you still have the build artifacts from before, your build will go faster this time because all of the native, that is to say, host operating system recipes are already built and deployed. Those recipes are what we generally use to cross-compile the dependencies for other architectures. For Red Hawk, this involves creating an XSD native build so that the core framework can parse its IDL, and similarly, for symbol matching against the Python Omni interfaces. But nevertheless, we're going to fast forward through this. At the end of the build, our script gives you a friendly message about how to use DD to write the image to the SD card. As stated, this requires an 8GB SD card for now, even though your build is nowhere close to that actually. 
We have it set to 8 right now because it's a common size in our office. You can modify the WKS definition in the Meta Red Hawk SDR Contrib folder to shrink things down if need be. And then you'll have to rerun the build. Fast forwarding again, mount the SD card in your host operating system. We still have to prepare to fix the U-boot situation. If you perform a directory listing of the boot partition, you'll see the device tree DTB file name is our machine name followed by the extension DTB. U-boot gets configured to look for the name device tree.dtb. Xilinx's two documentations of this procedure give you two different names, one of which is machine.dtb as you see here, but the rest of that procedure doesn't match the actual U-boot configuration. A similar situation exists for the name of the kernel image. It is UI image. So the device tree and kernel file name variables are two things we're going to have to fix in a moment. Next thing is that Xilinx's instructions lead you to believe that if you create a UENV text file, uBoot is going to read it. It won't. It's because uBoot was not configured to do it. We're going to fix that also on the first boot. So first, we need to create a UENV text file. You can find it linked in the video description to a gist on my GitHub. That file should go in your boot partition. Unmount the SD card from the host operating system and insert it into the microZ. Plug in your USB cable and get a terminal ready to connect to it at baud 115,200. You may have to tap return a few times, but you should end up seeing a U-boot prompt perhaps even with an error message saying it couldn't find certain files like device tree.dtb. So we'll fix that with the commands you can find in that gist. The file is called uboot first boot commands.txt. What those commands are actually doing is creating a variable called env load, which will fetch and import the env text file. It also changes the boot command to first run the env load command, followed by mode boot ensuring UENV gets applied first so you can override boot parameters with a text file rather than recompile in the future. Now, if you read the UENV text file, you'll see it sets the kernel underscore image to the UI image name and the device tree underscore image to our machine.dtb name. It also modifies the boot arguments, which you would define in the device tree source, to make the root file system be our second partition, read-write, rather than the Xilinx default of a tarball for a file system. The UENV text file also creates the UENV command variable, which is almost identical to the SD boot one. It then changes mode boot to point to the UENV command rather than SD boot. So in essence, these two changes redirected the boot process to read any environment variable changes from UENV text and then run mode boot, whatever that happens to be pointed at at the time. When you type reset in uBoot, it will reboot the device and should cruise all the way down into a login prompt. The user is root with no password at this time. Try running node booter dash capital D as we did in the previous video. And there it is. Red Hawk domain running on a microZ. Like the QEMU from the previous video, you can point Red Hawk device managers of the same framework version at the microZ's IP address and they should be able to join it. But wouldn't we do the exact opposite? Install a device manager on the microZ and then point it at the infrastructure domain. Probably. In fact, that was the E310 Cognitive Radio Demo video from 2016. We used Edis's E310 manifest, added Meta Redhawk SDR to the layer configuration, and built Redhawk usurp uhd image. When it booted the first time, we pointed OmniOrb config at our x86 Redhawk domain and restarted the E310 one more time just for kicks. From there forward, it came right up as a device manager with its usurp UHD device pre-configured on the domain. And pending some upcoming discussions, hopefully for our next video, we'll demo a system we did recently where we loaded Redhawk and OpenCPI onto an Ivea Atlas 1 Z7E based radio. The OpenCPI assets control the front end through the FPGA fabric dynamically and custom Red Hawk device links against those assets. The resulting system boots as a front-end interface's 2.0 compliant Red Hawk device in control of its FPGA. So, till next time, thanks for watching.
This is Thomas with Geon Technologies. Please feel free to contact us for in-class training and support.